Welcome to the Macmillan Report. I'm Marilyn Wilkshire, host, and our guest is David Simon, a lecturer of political science and ethics, politics, and economics at Yale University. David Simon studies African politics, focusing on the politics of development, assistance, and post-conflict situations, particularly in Rwanda. He is editor of the Historical Dictionary of Zambia and has contributed to Comparative Political Studies, the Journal of Commonwealth and Comparative Politics, and the Journal of Genocide Research. He also teaches classes on international relations in Africa and the comparative politics of development. Today we talk with Professor Simon about building state capacity to prevent atrocity crimes. Welcome, Professor Simon. Thank you for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. Okay, we are um, almost at the 20th anniversary of genocide in Rwanda, 2014 being the year um, for the 20th anniversary. How has that country recovered? To what extent has mm -hmm. it recovered mm -hmm. um, at this point 20 years later? Rwanda's recovery has really been remarkable. Uh, if you consider the scale of what happened there, mm -hmm. uh, hundreds of thousands of people killed, uh, no one knows the precise numbers. Uh, the, the, in a country of seven million in the first place, millions of refugees and displaced persons, and uh, uh, destruction throughout the countryside. Twenty years later, the country is, uh, in many ways, one of Africa's success stories. Mm -hmm. In the, what ways? The economy is growing in the upper single digits and sometimes in double digits mm -hmm. per year. The, uh, uh, the country it has embarked on ambitious plans to in start new industries, engage in new economic activities. Uh, the place is one of the cleanest countries in Africa. There's yeah. been a, I had a Rwandan friend uh, here last week and he could just shake his, all he could do is shake his head at the litter of plastic bags in our countries mm -hmm. because plastic bags, for example, are are banned in Rwanda. Rwanda has climbed up, in a good sense, the, uh, the anti-corruption rankings, Transparency International rankings, mm -hmm. an unprecedented rise from the uh, 150, 160 range out of the 200 or so or 185 countries that Transparency International uh, ranks, uh, to um, the 60s and 70s, one mm -hmm. of the least corrupt countries in Africa. Now, all of that is absolutely remarkable, and that's primarily on the economic and governance side. Mm -hmm. the, the more difficult question, and the question I think that's harder to answer, is how it has recovered on the social and political sides. Mm -hmm. Socially, the, uh, there is a, a level of peace that is highly commendable. As I said, it's one of the safest countries, and it's not just crime, it's that there's very little chance of political violence in mm -hmm. that country. Again, something remarkable given the scale of destruction and violence in 1994. Um, however, all of this, both the economic and the social peace, has come at, at uh, I don't know if it's a cost, or has, has been made possible by a fairly firm, uh, uh, less, a firm political hand, a less than competitive democracy. Mm -hmm. And any time you're in that situation, uh, I think history has shown it's hard to gauge just how much dissent and discontent there is until it, it boils over. And there are many people who believe that, uh, that Rwanda is, has sort of shoved a lot of its troubles under the carpet, with, uh, but will have to confront them at some point. What kind of problems? Uh, ethnic discontent, <coughs> for one. So, so the, that still exists, basically. Well, it's interesting. The, cr you know, the crux of the genocide in Rwanda was that there had been a civil war, an invasion by a uh, predominantly Tutsi army, uh, and the Tutsis comprised about 15% of the population. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Hutus comprised most of the rest. This tiny sliver belonged to the Batwa ethnic group. Uh, and the Hutus were in power back in 1994. Uh, what happened was, in response to this rebel invasion, the Hutu government, um, actually after a peace, uh, a peace, peace accord in 1993, 
Uh, the government was trying to establish a, uh, a transitional government, a power-sharing government, and the extremists on the government side, supporters of the government who didn't want to see that power-sharing arrangement take place, uh, undermined all efforts to cede it, and uh, including assassinating the president, a Hutu, who had, uh, who had agreed on this power-sharing arrangement, or at least that's the for me, the most convincing theory as to what mm -hmm. triggered the, the genocide. But then the Hutus, civilian Hutus, uh, police, militias supporting the government or the extremists within the government, essentially set about massacring the entire Tutsi population as best they could mm -hmm. uh, over the course of 100 days. So the essence of the genocide is ethnic violence between Hutus and Tutsis. Wow. In fact, in Rwanda, it's called the genocide of the Tutsis, just to make clear uh, who was perpetrator yeah. and who was victim sure. in the, the Tutsi government's eyes. So the, the current government has socially mandated that people not refer to themselves as Hutu or Tutsis. And almost any Rwandan you meet will say something along the lines of, um, there are no such thing as Hutus and Tutsis anymore. We are all Rwandans. But can you tell physically the difference? Is there a way to tell? Not really. There are certainly stereotypes that hold true. Someone's a stereotypical um, looking Tutsi or a stereotypical looking uh, Hutu. Chances are even they have mixed blood, so mm -hmm. to speak. Um, but by and large, most people look, uh, you know, m many more people defy these stereotypes okay. than actually realize them. Is anyone tracking how the Tutsi population has come back? Well, that's or has it come back? Come back In from 20 years, I mean, that's right, not a, a relatively right. short time period. Right. It hasn't uh, come back naturally in the mm -hmm. sense of uh, the, the remnants of the Rwandan population regenerating through you know, marriage and, and, uh, and births. Uh, However, the Tutsi population is larger now than it was in 1994, largely because of what's called the retourné population. The, this Tutsi rebel army was comprised of, of exiles and the families of exiles who had left the country back around the time of independence in the early 1960s, had, uh, had lived in uh, what was then Zaire and in Uganda. Uh, and numbered by 1990, when this rebellion started, in the hundreds of thousands. As, the Tutsi, as this Tutsi rebel army, who, who abandoned the ceasefire once it was clear a genocide was starting to take place, once it was clear uh, civilian, Rwandan Tutsi civilians were being targeted, this really foreign-based rebel army, based on rebel, uh, foreign Tutsis, relaunched their, their, uh, their insurgency toppled the government after about three months uh, and has been in power ever since. As they established their control and power in the middle of 1994, uh, hundreds of thousands of these former exiles and families of descendants of those exiles moved back into the country. Okay. So that right now, although you're not one ought not to speak of Tutsis in Rwanda, right. at least in the government's eyes, there are both uh, survivor, a, a survivor Tutsi population and their progeny, and a retourné Tutsi right. population. The latter probably uh, is greater than the former. Mm -hmm. However, one of the things that's sort of missing is a, uh, if there's been a census, it has avoided, not for sort of understandable reasons, ethnic uh, nomenclature. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so no one really knows what the population of I which see. group is, okay. particularly since it's government policy mm -hmm. not to, to recognize those groups in the present, mm -hmm. although okay. there is recognition of those groups as part of history right. in Rwanda. Okay, so now 20 years later, what can we take away from that experience um, and with the hopes of preventing it from happening again? I think that, that's a great question. I think there are really two dimensions of it. One is to look at what happened in Rwanda, uh, to look at what uh, Rwandans did or, not, did or did not do. Uh, and the other is to look at the international community's mm -hmm. reaction. And I think in some ways what really, 
makes the the 20th anniversary of Rwanda a an important uh, point of retrospection mm -hmm. is that uh, many of the same issues about international responses to mass atrocities mm -hmm. are, I think, obviously on our table, uh, staring us in the face once again. Right. And it's not only that, it's, uh, it's not only the sort of timeliness of it for that reason, but it, Rwanda matters because in a way it's, Rwanda is the sort of crucible for uh, the somewhat undetermined uh, set of responses that we have in front of us. Rwanda has shaped the notion of of how we respond and how we ought to respond mm -hmm. to mass atrocities without providing a, uh, a, a ironclad answer. Mm -hmm. And so what happened in Rwanda, and it's also important to note that in April 1994 was the exact same time that the first of the so-called uh, UN safe areas in Bosnia, in Garajda, mm -hmm. was being overrun by Serbian militias. Right. So in two instances, uh, in the world, you had civilian populations being threatened by insurgencies or militias, uh, violent actors, mm -hmm. and you had the United Nations with a presence in both cases. There was a United Nations force in Rwanda in 1994, um, but in both cases the UN completely backed down, allowed civilian populations essentially to be slaughtered. And so the first the first uh, turn after 1994, after both of those episodes, and for Bosnia, it really took the fall of Srebrenica and the onslaught uh, against Zepa in, uh, in 1995. But following, those were traumatic experiences for the international community, mm -hmm. and particularly for UN peacekeepers, uh, for whom this happened on their watch. Mm -hmm. And so in both cases, you had this sort of, this. Um, phase of introspection, of report writing, uh, that culminated in a, a resolve to do better. Mm -hmm. It could have resulted in, and there are many people who argued that, that Bosnia and Rwanda proved that the UN should not get involved in these situations, that they were out of control, that there was nothing that, they, that the UN could do, and that therefore they should just retreat. Uh, however, what carried the day was the realization that there were actors on the ground that could have made a difference, mm -hmm. uh, but did not. And in fact, in Rwanda, what happened was there was this 2,000 strong peacekeeping force, 2,500 in fact, strong peacekeepers on the ground in Rwanda. Uh, two weeks after the start of the genocide, had not necessarily been recognized as a genocide yet, but mm -hmm. uh, on April 21st, 1994, the UN voted to withdraw almost the entire force. Why? Because the leading members of the Security Council, the most involved members of the Security Council, uh, did not want to put their troops in harm's way. I see. And they, they, maybe they didn't have as good a read of the situation as they would have liked. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, they were getting, we know now from looking back at the, at the record, they were getting conflicting reports from two different actors on the ground, both, whom, both of whom represented the UN. General Romeo Dallaire was the force commander for UNAMIR, the UN peacekeeping mm -hmm. force, and he was saying, we need more troops. We need, uh, we can stop this. Uh, chaos is, is breaking out, um, but there's a lot that we can do. And meanwhile, the, uh, the Secretary General's special representative, a, po a political figure rather than a military figure, was saying, um, chaos is breaking out, but all we, what we have to bring the political leaders together, we have to negotiate with these, uh, uh, with these two forces that are fighting one another. We need a ceasefire, and if there's not going to be a ceasefire, there's no room for, for UN intervention. But pr so there, that sort of mixed message situation gave, I think, the Security Council cover to withdraw, mm -hmm. but in fact, the, the instructions from Washington, from Paris, from London uh, became, get those guys out. Mm -hmm. it, recall, this is six months after the uh, tragedy in Mogadishu, the Black Hawk Down incident, mm -hmm. in which, um, was it 19 uh, U.S. Uh, uh, rangers were, army rangers were killed 
in what seemed like a very similar action, mm -hmm. uh, an intervent a humanitarian intervention that was uh, designed, originally designed to protect uh, civilian lives. And so the U.S. had no appetite, Clinton had no appetite mm -hmm. for ramping up intervention in another admittedly obscure African and country. And I was going to get to that point. It's yeah. because probably it was in Africa necessarily. I think that, yeah. that not more was done. Right. And, and many people looking <clears throat> back said their first reaction was, Rwanda, I'd better figure out where that is on a map. They just hadn't yeah, exactly. heard of it before. Okay, so now as you know, we, we look at Darfur today right. and more recently Syria, Absolutely. how can we take what we learned in Rwanda and apply it to those places? Okay, great. The, um, the, as I was saying, after 1990, around 1999, you had this period, this period of uh, introspection and retrospection. Kofi Annan, who was the director of peacekeeping operations at the, time, mm. at the time of Rwanda, and therefore I think felt, as Clinton did, sort of guilty and complicit in some ways, commissioned... Especially uh, probably as an African. Yes, yes. Uh, he com uh, Anand commissioned a group, uh, a private uh, group of individuals called the International Commission on Intervention and State Sovereignty, mm -hmm. or ISIS, that he asked to make recommendations regarding what should we do when these mass atrocities start to unfold? What should the United Nations do? And they came up with what is, this commission uh, uh, sort of cogitated for several months and came back with a proposal for the uh, doctrine of responsibility to protect, okay. which says that there are, uh, that first of all, states have a responsibility to protect their own populations and proposes that the international community help states do that, but also says that when states fail to protect their own populations, the international community has a responsibility to step in and provide that protection. Mm -hmm. So we have this sort of doctrinal response available to us, something we can sort of hang our, our, our coat on as, mm -hmm. we're, as we say we're going in and we're doing this. However, the existence of doctrine doesn't necessarily guide us very well in a new situation. Right, Syria is not Rwanda, mm -hmm. Darfur is not Rwanda, nor is it Bosnia, right. or, nor are, are either one of these Kosovo, <coughs> which is sort of the third insti uh, instance that inspired uh, a, new, uh, a new doctrine. Mm -hmm. One of the core uh, proposals of ISIS, of responsibility to protect, is that if there is to be international intervention, it be international in character. Mm -hmm. And in fact, that the UN, uh, along with regional organizations, are recognized to have the sort of legitimacy that bilateral actors in, the bi bilateral actors don't. Mm -hmm. the bilateral actors may have the ability, the will to intervene, uh, but ultimately that intervention becomes I illegitimate in international terms if it, it sort of contravenes uh, what the Security Council has said. Mm -hmm. Of course, the Security Council is a very political body. Right. We've seen divisions, especially between Russia and China on one side, the U.S. and sometimes France and sometimes uh, U.K. on the other, uh, not um, you know, having fundamental disagreements on whether or not uh, the sovereign responsibilities of a, of a government like Syria have been mm -hmm. abrogated in, in right, some right, sense. Right. Okay, so you've recently written a, a paper um, about building state capacity mm -hmm. to prevent atrocity crimes and implementing their, the responsibility to protect mm -hmm. framework. Um, so what are the basic tenets of that responsibility to protect doctrine? Well, two points to start out with. Uh, one is that um, the, uh, the responsibility to protect does, in fact, involve a much broader sort of menu or set of ideas than bombing a place when, or sending in bombers when atrocities are unfolding. Mm -hmm. And in fact, uh, the impetus for writing this, uh, this uh, paper, uh, which is essentially a policy brief, was to, to try to highlight many of the upstream actions that can be done to prevent uh, atrocities from happening in the first place. Like what? Uh, 
Uh, and so there are a couple different, uh, different sets of, of actions. One are the, the types of things that you can do to um, make a state stronger in a way that it, uh, that it can prevent mass atrocities. Mm -hmm. Part of that is if, we, if we're figuring that mass atrocities happen because non-state actors undertake them. Mm -hmm. And this is part of the, um, the, it's not a fiction because those do happen, mm -hmm. but it's a fiction that that's the only way in which it happens. Right. But it, it helped sell this doctrine to the United Nations membership to mm -hmm. say that we are trying to strengthen states to prevent um, to, to prevent or to allow them to prevent others from, from committing mass atrocities. But there are things that can be done. A stronger, and this is important, more professional police force mm -hmm. that is trained in uh, respecting human rights and acting against those who would deny others human rights. Mm -hmm. A legal framework that provides for that. Uh, institutions that allow civilians to register complaints. Uh, we don't have these in the United States. We don't have a, a human rights commission or an ombudsman because we think our political process can handle, the, right. uh, handle, handle it a lot better. But those are the types of institutions that I think um, can be made fairly robust and are, are promising as, uh, as sort of stand-ins uh, for uh, maybe for the political mm -hmm. process. The, the other thing, though, that I was going to say about mm -hmm. this is that the way that states can prevent mass atrocities is not to commit them in the first place. Right. And in fact, if we look at the past decade or so of, uh, of, of mass atrocities, states are, if, if not complicit, are or if not doing themselves, uh, doing them themselves, mm -hmm. uh, have been complicit uh, in those uh, those mass atrocities. Right. So the second cut at this is, well, what can a, uh, how can a state sort of constrain itself, or better yet, how can a civilian population strengthen itself to stand up to a state without engaging in conflict, mm -hmm. which is more likely to result in a situation where mass atrocities happen. I mean, looking at Syria, Syria started at, as uh, Arab Spring style protest, Tunisian style mm -hmm. protests, uh, devolved into um, sort of pitched battles between the government and protesters and ultimately to outright civil war mm -hmm. with weapons of mass, mass destruction right. being used. So the two components of constraining a state are one a legal framework, and it's interesting to see this come up just in the past few days, mm -hmm. where Syria has expressed willingness to sign the uh, Convention Against Chemical Weapons, which it had not signed before. These international instruments really do matter. They provide uh, enforcement mechanisms. They provide st uh, protocols for, you know, in the case of uh, chemical weapons, for. Uh, disposing of uh, certain materials. Uh, there, are, there are trade arrangements that go along with that. Mm -hmm. And the f when a, a country accedes to a protocol or a convention or ratifies a convention like this, the international community has more purchase on that country when it looks like it might be about to violate, when its state might be about to violate those conventions. Mm -hmm. So the, the, these things really matter, and there are a wide range of conventions uh, regarding human rights, regarding the rights of minorities, chemical weapons, et cetera, right. uh, that, uh, that can constrain the state. The second realm is, as I've proposed before, uh, what civil society can do. Mm -hmm and in particular peaceful civil society, because sometimes, arguably, civil society creates militias, uh, the, the Serbian militias that were some of the most uh, um, violent back in the, the Bosnian Wars, actually arose out of a, a football club, a soccer team mm -hmm. support group. Uh, yeah. So civil society is not always uh, good and, and, and happy times, right. however, uh, in its ideal form, if it has the space, if people have the space to act together without being 
monitored or controlled or subject to government reprisal simply for getting together, mm -hmm. then I think there is a greater chance of, uh, of resisting sort of extremism uh, in the government. And it matters actually because governments are seldom uh, monolithic in these points of crisis. You'll have would-be moderates and would-be extremists. And if the would-be moderates know that they have support in civil society, they have more of a possibility of prevailing in that intra-government uh, struggle uh, for power. And I think we've seen that in various cases, perhaps in a place like uh, Tunisia, um, perhaps even to some extent in post-Qaddafi Libya, where there are extremists out there and there are what I'm calling very stylized uh, sense uh, moderates. And uh, you know, sometimes the moderates win, and that happens in particular when both within, this, within the government and within civil society, they're enabled mm -hmm. or empowered. If I could bring one more example sure. of what civil society uh, can do, it's it's very uh, inspiring uh, example. In uh, 2003, I believe, uh, Liberia was at the what turned out to be the very tail end of uh, 12 years of of turmoil, mm -hmm. not constant civil war, but uh, two or three iterations of uh, armed violence between government and and militia groups. And uh, peace talks seemed to be about to fail at that, uh, at that juncture. Mm -hmm. uh, and it looked like, um, you know, for all the best efforts for the U.S. had sent a battleship of some sort and a marine contingent that had actually landed uh, in the outskirts of Monrovia and then sort of mysteriously to the Liberian population retreated. Uh, they were just doing some reconnaissance, it turns out. But a group of uh, Liberian women who had sort of become empowered through the civil society movement and had uh, uh, fancied themselves as a political force to be reckoned with, decided that they were going to stand up to these negotiators, these militia negotiators, m military negotiators, who were kind of giving up. Mm -hmm. And uh, they said they surrounded the, the forum of negotiations and said, you know, we're not leaving. You're going to have to walk through mm -hmm. us. You're going to have to trample us. It'll look horrible internationally. Mm -hmm. uh, go back in and, and make peace. And in fact, the culmination of that was uh, Charles Taylor's agreement. He was then the, uh, the, uh, the president, but the sort of, uh, he had no international credibility. So the, his agreement to go into exile in Nigeria, where after a few years he was uh, uh, corralled mm -hmm. and is and, and sent to the Hague. Right. Um, so it's a long story with many twists, but right. it's there's this inspiring moment at which civil society stood up to prevent uh, further hostilities, right. if not specifically mass atrocities. It, it, very inspiring, but unfortunately, I think very unusual. Definitely. Um, and, definitely. and what strikes me is um, 20 years later that we're still dealing with countries in different ways instead of some uniform way right. to take care right. of, um, you know, mass killings. Right. There are a couple reasons for that. One is that, as I said before, no, no mass atrocity situation is like the previous one, mm -hmm. just as armies... Other than millions of people being killed. Other than million, <laughs> millions of people being killed, or yeah. sometimes even just thousands or tens of thousands right. um, of people being killed. It, it, it can still... Mass atrocity, the mass part, need not reach a certain threshold. Mm -hmm. What is actually the minimum? There really is curious. no minimum. Okay. According to the Genocide Convention, um, there don't even... There do not... There does not have to be a minimum uh, death toll. Okay. Uh, simply the contemplation of the elimination of a protected group is enough uh, for there to be, uh, for the genocide uh, convention to uh, come into effect. Okay. Practically, numbers matter. Mm -hmm. um, a, a shooting of five protesters of a certain ethnic group uh, with someone saying, you know, death to all of them, which would, you know, signal the intent to destroy in part, mm -hmm. which is all the UN. You know, practically, I su strictly speaking, that might constitute an act of genocide. Mm -hmm. Practically, no one's going to you know, you know, pull the 
imaginary genocide convention fire alarm and right. say, uh, now we have to act. Uh, however, uh, mass atrocities and mass atrocities is a broader category that includes genocide but also includes the war crimes, the use of weapons of mass destruction, for mm -hmm. example. Um, you know, a, a thousand can be, uh, can be enough. Right. Um, but, but sometimes the numbers can be a distraction, I think. And uh, things like the intent, the, the horror, the vulnerability of civilian populations, the extent to which a specific group is threatened, those uh, items may matter more. But to get back to your question about uh, why don't we have a, a sort of standard response, the, uh, the situations are different, mm -hmm. and the tendency is to, is to fight the last mass atrocity or to counter the last mass atrocity. And often that what was right last time isn't right this time. Mm -hmm. um, in, uh, although there was a civil war in Rwanda or in Darfur for that matter, the relative power and capability of the rebels in Darfur or Syria is a lot different in the composition of those rebels and the sort of legitimacy and a willingness to work with those rebels mm -hmm. uh, is a lot different uh, now than it was or would have been in Rwanda because of course in Rwanda we didn't work with those rebels. In the end, we let the rebels win and that was the solution mm -hmm. to, the, uh, to the genocide. Uh, the, the meaning that the rebels, the, the RPF, the Tutsi rebel group, stopped the right. genocide. But the second reason is that you know, the situation on the ground is different each time. And the second reason is that the situation in uh, New York as a, or, or Geneva is different. The mm -hmm. international uh, constellation is different. Right. So in retrospect, in Rwanda, maybe there could have been, uh, if the Security Council fought a little harder, thought about it a little longer, uh, there could have been more resolute action. In fact, uh, three weeks after the sort of shameful withdrawal of, of uh, U UN peacekeepers, they reversed course and authorized a 5,000 peacekeeper uh, uh, force mm -hmm. to, to go to Rwanda to stop the genocide, and it arrived two weeks after the genocide was over. Yeah. But there was you know, concerted action. Right. In Libya, there was... Uh, or with respect to Libya, there was a, a, uh, some unanimity at this. The, we were able to get a, a, uh, a Security Council resolution passed, uh, and, and NATO was given sort of the responsibility uh, you know, and, and to use the force necessary to end atrocities. And there was, of course, a debate over um, what the force necessary was and what the strategy necessary was. Did that include regime change? Mm -hmm. um, but there was, uh, there was uh, enough of a consensus within the Security Council to authorize something. In Syria, we don't see that at all. Okay. And I was so, going to ask you, what do you think is going to happen there in Syria? I don't know. Um, it's, bec it's uncharted territory mm -hmm. in the sense that, on one hand, we have this doctrine of responsibility to protect. Uh, on the other hand, uh, we have more reluctance by more parties to put it into place. And on the ground, it's a very, very messy situation. Um, the, ultimately, the idea of uh, the doctrine rests on the protection of civilians, mm -hmm. not on helping one side or the other win. And the more we see this, the more I think, see this conflict unfold, the uglier it's getting, the, the less uh, we, we, we don't want to help one side or the other win. But going in and finding, uh, setting up zones of protection, which was the, 19, the really failed 1990s method, mm -hmm. in, in Bosnia at least, uh, seems well off the radar at this point. Uh, taking military action against one side or the other is, um, obviously it's been contemplated. Um, but even as it was contemplated as an appropriate response, as a you know, sort of scale-wise, uh, because there has to be a response to, to uh, alleged and fairly obvious war crimes, um, just the, the effectiveness of them 
has been was called into question mm -hmm. by military observers and military analysts and and political analysts as well. And people were saying, well, you know, is a is a symbolic strike that doesn't change anything militarily? Uh, is that what responsibility to protect calls for? Mm -hmm. And many of the most ardent supporters of responsibility to protect say no. They say you need the legitimacy of the UN that we talked about beforehand right. and you need a chance of effectiveness. To some extent the the Russian proposal that's on the table now to uh, to get the Assad government to uh, give up its chemical weapons right. uh, is uh, is a you know a godsend mm -hmm. because it's not causing, it's not prompting this real crisis in responsibility to right. protect. On the other hand, you could say, going back to our dis earlier part of our discussion, it's exactly uh, the type of thing that responsibility protect also involves, and that is looking in the toolbox and seeing what else is there, employing international standards, applying international standards, um, sending inspectors in at some point. Mm -hmm. It's going to be very difficult in a time of war, but that principle, uh, in a way, reflects, uh, I think, a victory for the notion of responsibility to protect mm -hmm. in a broader sense, and a reminder that we have to view that doctrine in a broader sense, and not just a, a, uh, a doctrine of when do we intervene and, and with how much force. Right. Because it doesn't, you know, those two questions are ultimately political questions that the UN Security Council and or regional equivalents have to decide right. uh, and, and are much more difficult, uh, therefore, to come with right. perhaps the answer that, that uh, you know, citizens and, and observers of uh, the, the, the sort of atrocity prevention community um, uh, what we would ultimately want. Okay. Thank you so much for being here with us today and sharing your work. Oh, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. For more information about Professor Simon and his research, please visit our website at yale.edu slash Report. Be sure to join us again for another episode of the Macmillan Report, made possible through funding from the Whitney and Betty Macmillan Center for International and Area Studies at Yale.